Upton Wood by William Horwood A clash of good and evil in the savage kingdom of moles. This highest and most desolate part of Duncton Wood is also most venerable, for beneath its rustling surface is the site of the ancient mole system of Duncton, long deserted and lost. Here too stands the great stone, at the highest point of the hill where the beaches thin out, bare to all the winds, north, south, east and west. And from here a mole might see, or rather might sense, the stretching triangle of Duncton Wood, spreading out below to the escarpment on the east side and the pastures on the west, with the marsh where no mole goes beyond the northern end. At the time Bracken and Rebecca first met, and for many generations before, the system lay on the lower slopes of the hill where the wood was wide and rich. There the beaches gave way to oaks and ashes and thick fern banks and pockets of sun in the summer. Down there life ran rich and good with a wormful soil black with mold, moist with change. There the wind was slowed and softened by the trees. Bracken was born on an April night in a warm dark burrow deep in the historic system of Duncton Wood, six mole years after Rebecca. This is the story of their love and their epic struggle to find it. It is a true story drawn from many sources, and the fact that it can be told at all is as great a miracle as the history it relates. But without one other mole, Blessed Boswell of Uffington, Bracken and Rebecca would have died the death of legend, the tale declining into the darkness of time as a simple story of love. It was much more than that, as the records kept by Boswell show, and it is these that form the bulk of the material on which this history is based. There are other sources, some in the libraries of the holy burrows, others hewn in solitary stone or carried still in the legends of each system whose tunnels life made these three moles enter. But these are mere shadows when set against the work of Boswell himself. But for his love and enterprise, there would be no Bracken now. Yet without Bracken, Boswell could never have found his great task. And without Rebecca, there would be nothing at all to tell so link their three names together in a blessing on their memory and on the troubled time in which they had to make their lives. Part 1 Duncton Wood Chapter 1 September A great grey storm swept its pelting rain up the pastures of Duncton Hill and then on into the depths of the oaks and beaches of Duncton Wood itself. At first the wind lashed the trees, which swayed and whipped each other in the wet. But then the wind died and solid rain poured down, running in rivulets down the tree trunks and turning the leaf mold of the wood into a sodden carpet, cold and wet. And the noise the endless random drumming of the rain drowning every other sound. Not a scurrying fox or a scampering rabbit or a scuffling mole could be heard above the noise. Until, when all had found their burrows, the wood was as still in the endless eternal rain as a lost and forgotten tunnel. All the moles but one were deep in the ground, hiding themselves from the wet and noise safe and sound in the warmth of their dark burrows. Only solitary Bracken stayed out, crouching up on top of the hill among the great beaches that had swayed in the wind and at the coming of the rain, and now stood in sullen surrender to it, dripping and grey. He had left the fighting and the talons of the tunnels far behind below the hill and found himself now in the shadow of the great stone 
the curious isolated standing stone that stood silent and huge at the highest point of the wood. It was tens of millions of years old and it looked its age, hard, gnarled and grey. There were others like it scattered across the downs of southern England, remnants of the mass that once covered all the chalk. As heartstones of the old mass, they retained its rhythm, and this gave them a life and mystery that every creature sensed. Until some, like the moles, learned to turn to them at times of thanksgiving or wonder, suffering or pain, or change, as Bracken did now. He had been there since the early afternoon, when the shifting September sky, now blue and clear, now white and cloudy, had given way to the deep mauve greys of storm clouds. He had crouched enthralled, sensing the rain lash the country far away in great sweeps of wet, and in awe of the white lightning whose bright flashes his eyes only dimly saw, and the strong shakings of the thunder that entered his body. He felt the storm coming closer and closer, looming towards and above him, and then finally all around, the wind ruffling his fur before the rain turned it shiny black. Now he was absolutely lost in it, his paws seeming part of the ancient ground on which they rested, his fur seeming the sky itself, his face the wind and rain. Bracken was lost, no longer conscious of what he thought he was. Not a mole, but a part of everything. As the rain beat down upon him, it finally washed away a hopeless desire he had long struggled with. To be a mole like so many of the others, with talons flashing, fighting, rough and tough, and eating worms with a hungry crunch. When he laughed, they didn't laugh, but in the rain it no longer mattered. When he lay still as surface roots, they fought and strove, and as the rain ran off his shining black fur into the leaves, he knew it would always be like that. When he made for a shaft of sun among the ferns, they pointed, nervous, to the owl heights above, and always would. He had lived three mole years alone and in silence, struggling with his desire to run down and back, to try to start again with them, but now that desire was being washed away forever in a storm. There was no mole, not in the Duncton system at least, or that he knew of, to share his love of the sun and his hatred of talons. Above him, the stone was running with rain, leaning away from the beech tree whose roots entwined its base, towards the furthest hills and vales his weak eyes could never see, towards the west where Uffington lay. But he could feel the world beyond like sun upon his face, and it was greater, far greater, than the system in which he had been born and which, in a storm, he now shed. He crouched, surrendered like this for a long time, before he became even dimly aware that another mole was near him, watching him from a clump of green sanicle. He didn't move, he wasn't afraid. Indeed, after he realized that some mole was there, he started thinking of something different. How strange it was that as evening fell, the sky grew lighter. Perhaps it had something to do with the softening rhythm of the rain. He was right, for high above the hill the swirling masses of the storm clouds gave way to cliffs of whiter cloud, and the rain's noise became a patter as the irregular drip of individual droplets from the trees that surrounded the clearing around the stone could be heard once more. Then, as the mantle of rain dropped from him, he turned to face the watching mole with no fear and little interest. The mole was a little older than he, and female. From the great distance he felt himself to be in, he sensed rather than watched her, feeling her to be perplexed, anxious, lost. To his surprise, he sensed no aggression at all towards him, none whatsoever, 
though she was as big as he was, almost an adult, but not quite. Finally, she came forward into the open by the stone. I'm lost. How do I get back into the system? She asked. He didn't answer immediately, so she added, I'm a Duncton mole, you know. He knew all right. He could tell by the way she was, the woody scent. His silence was not suspicion, as she seemed to think, but pleasant surprise. No mole had ever asked him a favor like this in the days when he had lived in the main system. It's easy, he said, very easy. She seemed happy at this, relaxing in his calm as she rubbed her head with one of her paws and waited. Suddenly, he scurried past her down the hill by a track she had crossed a dozen times in her journey up the hill, one of the ancient forgotten tracks up to the stone. Come on, he called, I'll show you. They twisted and turned down the wet track, the great evening clouds swirling between the treetops high above, while the wet fronds of the undergrowth tumbled rainwater onto their fur. He darted this way and that, down and down the hill, until she was quite out of breath following him. Suddenly, by a fallen oak branch, he stopped at an entrance she knew, dark, warm and inviting. There you are, he said. I told you it was easy. You know where you are now, don't you? Yes, yes she did, and she nodded, but she was thinking of him, looking right into him it seemed. He remembered no other mole ever looking at him like this. Curious, compassionate, friendly. Suddenly she came forward and touched him with her paw, or rather caressed him on his shoulder, for a second that he remembered a lifetime. What's your name? she asked. I'm Bracken, he said after a moment, and then suddenly turned and scurried off up the track and into the evening light. And light dawned on her. She gasped and reached out after him and started to run back the way he had gone. Bracken! So he was Bracken, so hunched, so small, so defenseless. I'm Rebecca, she called. My name is Rebecca. But he was gone long before the words were out. Then she stopped and turned back to the tunnel he had led her to, and ran with relief back into the depths of the main system. At the spot by the entrance to the tunnel where she had touched him so briefly, the air was very still and quiet, with just the drip, drip, drip of the last of the rain from the trees, while far away the heart of the storm moved on across country, leaving Duncton Wood to the silence of the evening and its higher deserted part to the silence of the stone.